Hi there, I'm Tim Power, and you and I are currently under the fortress of pop culture. I don't know why, we just are. And if you're a Kylie fan, then you are in for a treat today. If you're not a Kylie fan, then go and purchase some joy in your life, for God's sake. So Hyde Park in London is coming up. It's only a few weeks away, and our Kylie will be headlining. It's called BST Hyde Park. By the way, can you message me and tell me what that stands for? Sorry, stupid me. And Robbie Williams is also on the bill. But I'm not clear if it's the same date as Kylie, because this festival, as I understand it, it runs over several days. But is there a possibility of a kid's performance? Could be. And will our Kylie use the momentum of the Hyde Park event to finally break some news on her new music? I'm getting antsy, yo! Surely it's time for that tension update by now, right? We're about to talk about that rumoured Netflix deal. Yep, you've read about it all over social media and, of course, the alleged autobiography. But first, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who listened to the last podcast where we spoke all things Justin Timberlake and Orville Peck. Huge feedback on both conversations uh, about the guests. Very complimentary. Thank you for that. Many people rated the show five stars too, which... If you're a regular listener, you know that's how we keep this show commercial free. So thank you for that. Keep our show alive. Rate us on whatever app you're using. And judging by the feedback, not many of you have any sympathy at all for Mr. Timberlake. Or his arrest, of course, that happened. But our John, regular listener John, is a JT fan. And he sent us his thoughts. Greeting Time to Talk Australia. This is your American John over here. I like to add on to the uh, Justin Timberlake uh, issue going on now. I was shocked to hear he got arrested. Thinking he's a family man, you know, somewhat good image. I know he is. I was reading about personal stuff going on and, you know, uh, I am probably the minority in the uh, in this uh, comment, but I've been there since when he went solo. I wasn't a big fan of NSYNC. I like some of their stuff. I was like a secret NSYNC fan because that was not cool to be out open about that. But later on, I liked uh, his solo album, his very first album, Justified. But yeah, just the arrest of you know like uh well everybody was saying why is he driving if he's got money get an uber have your driver you know drive you i didn't understand that was he with somebody that's i don't understand that be responsible you got the money i guess the, you know rich people problems i guess i would love to have that problem which car to drive today but yeah getting to the arrest yeah i was like just shocked that it happened to him and he said well i guess i'm not gonna make the concert what concert the cop that arrested him he's 24 he had no idea who he was so which was kind of funny and i'm like i saw the picture of the cop who arrested him he looks like one of those uh cops you would see in those those adult movies wink wink <laughs> but yeah just wanted to chime in briefly um yeah that's kind of crazy they kind of made the made the headlines with his mugshot. His eyes were glossy, but I guess if you like glossy, that look it does something for you. There you go. But uh, that's what I wanted to say. All right, thank you. Thanks, John. I'm thinking of you often, my friend. I really am. I know you're doing it tough, which just is not fair for such a lovely, uh, generous person. You are so generous. I promise you, I'm sending you lots of positive energy, John. And of course, if you would like to follow John's lead by sending us your thoughts about the show or any of the topics that you're hearing, well, I'd be delighted. Just record your thoughts and then email them through to to Australia 
all one word, time to talk Australia at Outlook.com. And by the way, if you want to come on the show and have a chat with me about your favourite pop artist, uh, maybe a film, a TV show, anything to do with the world of pop culture, if you're passionate about it and you think more people need to know about it, reach out to me, send me an email. I'd love to learn more and possibly we can line something up. So what do you think? Is it time to get out of this basement and up into the fortress? Well, stick close because see that pipe there? Squeezing through it just might get ugly. Coming to you from the mountain fortress of pop culture. You're listening to Time to Talk. I use pledge and donation synonymous with one another. But I don't, and it's heard. I don't use it synonymously. Nathan! Hello. How are you? I'm, yeah, I'm all right, thanks. How are you? You're moving house, Nathan. Ugh, oh, I am. Why the devil are you doing that? Because my landlord tries to lock me into a year-long contract and they were like, oh, we're not going to give you any time. You either sign for a year or you get out. And I was like, right, fine, then I'll get out. So I did. <laughs> You didn't want to sign for a year? That's pretty usual over here, 12-month leases. Didn't want to do it. Yeah, but we'd already signed for a year, and and typically they go to rolling contracts, but the Uh, landlord was just being a dick. Are you going somewhere better? Um, It's it's somewhere cheaper. I'd I'd say that's better. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I'm going to read you an article, Nathan, because that's what you're here for. Kylie Minogue is writing her autobiography after reaching the pinnacle of her career. Little do they know, by the way, whoever wrote this. She ain't done yet. She's still climbing. The Australian pop singer has reportedly decided it's the right time to put pen to paper with the help of a ghostwriter after finishing her Las Vegas residency and scooping a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Brits earlier this year. And here's the quote from the anonymous source who is speaking to The Sun on Sunday newspaper, quote, Kylie is at the pinnacle of her career and now feels like the perfect time to write about her life and relive some memories, says The Source. Uh, Nathan, what are you making of the Netflix special and this rumour that she's writing an autobiography? The thing with um, celebrity of now versus the celebrity of, of you know older days is that obviously we expect more of our celebrities we expect we expect to be able to kind of be in in their lives more um so i do understand why she might be considering these things i do doubt she's writing an autobiography i can't imagine her doing that um but i do understand why she might want to allow um fans in on her life a little bit more now because it is just more it's expected it's just it's something that <laughs> has changed over the years, especially with social media and things like that. I've been following Kylie for her whole career, as you know, and she is one of the most private celebrities ever. She has absolutely yeah. perfected the art of not appearing particularly private. She appears yeah. <laughs> to give of herself very well, but she gives nothing. We actually know nothing. <clears throat> if you think of all the relationships she's had – uh, fertility issues, um, the cancer journey. We only know the tip and good on us, good on her. I mean, we should only know the tip of all of that. Here's my problem, Nathan, a Netflix fly on the wall documentary Mm-mm-mm. and writing an autobiography. Well, one of the golden rules of an autobiography, it needs to be honest. Kylie's not going to give the whole story. And to me, that's a little <laughs> bit not honest. So what's the bloody point, you know? I I love her more than anyone on, in the world, but I can't imagine Netflix getting a million dollars worth out of Kylie for a documentary. <laughs> the thing is, though, is that with with the Netflix one in particular, um, because that is the one I'm more interested in. Because, like you say, I I, I am very skeptical on the autobiography. But the thing with this Netflix documentary is, I think she would have to give, um a lot more than she'd be used to. Um, but I think if she has done this, she's going to be very shrewd about it. Um, I, I imagine she would be securing 
um, heavy funding and sponsorships for a potential tour that is coming down the line. Um, and if she has done it because of that, I can understand where she's coming from because it, you know, <laughs> it's going to look really good if she's been sponsored by Netflix for her tour. If they are really heavily sponsoring her, she's able to put on this incredible show for all of these new fans as well as as well as the older fans. Um, so from that perspective, can I understand why she might consider breaking her own rule on privacy for that? Yes, I can actually. I can understand why she might do that. I'm just a bit baffled by all of this. Um, really, this sort of almost commitment to opening herself up as you say that's the strategy open myself up a bit padam fans don't know so much about me let's retell the story a little bit but six figures god you harry and Meghan. you know i really do think you might be surprised though tim because the the thing is is that kylie is shrewd as we know she knows what these newer fans are going to be expecting of her. Mm. And do I think she's going to, do I think she's going to turn around and, and talk about every single thing, every, every nitty gritty detail? No. But I mean, recently when she was um speaking, oh, was it about Nick Cave or was it about um Michael Hutchins? I can't remember. But I mean, she, she admit, she vaguely alluded to drug use, didn't she? In, in that. Oh, she said, yeah, and but she said right from the beginning, he introduced me to lots of, the, like, she's very... Um, yeah, no, but what I'm saying is she'd never she'd never used that terminology before, for example. True, you know, she, she true. Is, she is bringing these things up, and yeah. maybe now enough time has passed for her to talk about those things within a documentary. You've talked me into it a bit. I certainly didn't think she shouldn't do it. I guess it was when I heard, again, <laughs> I'm repeating myself a bit, but when I heard the figure... That's almost the type of documentary where after it airs, the very next day you expect in all the papers, on the front page of everything, some salacious story that nobody ever knew. Yeah. yeah. I, but I don't think they're going to get that out of Kylie. But if now that I'm listening to you, the intersection of album number two, because she's going to do the tension update, by the time this documentary mm-hmm. slash autobiography land, it could coincide with album number two, feed yep. the album and it's the perfect in because that's what you do when you strategize right you want everything to to intersect at once to synergize of course n- nuclear explosion of pop them and that's sort of where she's aiming i think i just yeah i, I, and I just sorry just sorry to interrupt you yeah, but you're also right. i mean they could they could give us an insight onto her creative process now that'd be interesting well for and the that's fans, not too it would invasive be. For the fans, it would be. I don't know. For the, I, I think this is very American. Uh, basically, I think Netflix might be keying in and, and plugging into the fact that Americans are just cottoning onto Kylie, so let's tell the story. And for me, yeah. maybe I'm not the right person to judge this because I know the story so well. I know what she's going to say about Michael. I know what she's going to say about cancer, drug use, being controlled by Stock Aiken and Waterman, finding fever, uh, cancer, her parents, her sister. I, I know the story, so maybe I'm not the right person to be judging this maybe some people will find it fascinating yeah maybe not but then again maybe we are the right people maybe we are going to be completely shocked i mean it's rare i'm going to be honest it's rare that i feel that way about about um kylie's endeavors because usually i know what to expect in the same way that you do um what's the one area you wish you'd dig into then let's let's talk about that idea that we might be surprised what's the little area of kylie's life that you feel is so locked away that you'd love to know more about it well, cert- like, like I said, certainly the creative process. Like I, I, I'm imagining this fly on the wall being when, while she is creating an album, which would be fascinating to see mm. how Kylie, how Kylie's creative process actually works, because she is so collaborative, and she does work with so many people, and they all absolutely gush about the things that she does when she's doing these things. So I am interested in that. Um, in terms of her personal life, I don't know really because. I don't love Kylie for her personal life. I love Kylie for her artistry. Um, mm. And I, I think you, I think to a degree you must feel the same because you were saying as well, you know, you don't necessarily want to know all of the nissy grissy details that she doesn't oh, there want are some to things, know. Nathan. There are some things, yeah. <laughs> Go on then, what's yours? Let's uh, see, I look, I'm sure I'll agree. Uh, absolutely. Well, you've sort of almost touched on it. Like those Michael Hutchins years, she's talked about, in broad brush strokes and she got a little bit deeper on an abc <laughs> documentary but i want to know what sex was like with michael hutchins i want to know 
what he did to her <laughs> in terms of <laughs> drug use. What is this introduced to many things? Because whenever she talks oh, about it, very romantic now. It's wine and food and travel. It's like, come on, Kylie. You know, really, what did he introduce you to in detail? Well, I mean, he died with a noose around his neck, playing with his willy. Yeah, what does she think so, of I mean, that? He's... Exactly, exactly. <laughs> because every other close friend of his has given their, I mean, even Paula Yates gave her version of what she thinks happened. Kim Wilson, who's an Australian celebrity, she gave her. Like, Kylie's never spoken about what she thinks happened. Uh, autobiography, what do you think it should be called? Well, I suppose it would be, I should be so lucky, wouldn't it? I mean, that's been a bit... Um, Could be. Better everywhere. the devil you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, something to do with lucky, though, I certainly think. Because if it was an autobiography, obviously, it would be talking about her romantic life. And it would be interesting. Um, and this idea of, like, <laughs> the the irony of I should be so lucky, I suppose. This has been <laughs> fun, Nathan, hasn't it? Have you missed for show? I have, I have, genuinely. Um, but there's just not been a great deal of Kylie news to go over, has there? <laughs> no, lots of rumours, but yeah, absolutely nothing firm yet. And Nathan, for people listening who don't know, is infamous for only talking on the show, never listening to the show. <laughs> that, that's his style. He listens to his episodes, I've noticed. <laughs> I listen, I to, listen to my episodes, but only my bit. <laughs> Only your bit. <laughs> as soon as it segues to another guest, he turns it off. <laughs> You're missing because I always get so mad because I know I need I need to be there to tell you all how wrong you are. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to. Inf- I do you don't listen. To, your blood. Sometimes I do see your topics and I do listen to them, but yeah. I'm very selective. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, there's a, there's a great one coming up straight after this, Nathan, on this very episode with Ewan, who is a massive Kylie fan and he's so insightful. So please don't press stop nathan <laughs> future nathan don't more press insightful stop. than me oh 100 times more insightful than you oh my god tim well that's because you're young my friend you haven't got wisdom i yet. think i'm so insightful i think i have a hot take on everything <laughs> you, you've got I an opinion do. about everything that's true I, I have well this is what i mean i think that's rather insightful even if you think i'm wrong <laughs> <laughs> take care nathan yeah have a wonderful day tim I'm having a gooseberry and cinnamon yogurt. Who wants a gooseberry and cinnamon yogurt? Chloe, would you like a gooseberry and cinnamon yogurt? Yes, please. Welcome to the Fortress of Pop Culture. It's fantastic to have you in here because I know you are a huge pop culture fan, aren't you? I Well, yes, I am. I, I have certain artists that I uh, love very much and I'm very devoted to. Kylie, of course, is one of them. But, um, you know, I, I would say probably I have about uh, 10 to 15 artists that I follow very, very devoutly. And uh, so when they tour or when they play... I try my best to see them as uh, wherever that may be in the world. So, I'm so looking forward to talking to you all things Kylie. But I'm just curious, do you notice what I notice in the world of pop? Like, uh, sometimes I feel like the age of the pop megastar has, is gone, is actually gone. Do you agree? Do you ever feel that yourself? Um, sometimes I do, but then I see people like Taylor Swift who are just yeah. cleaning up big time and uh, I'm really surprised and uh, amazed but also you know I applaud her somebody like Taylor Swift who has gone from zero to being so prolific and um, I mean she really is everywhere I went to a bookstore here in Las Vegas recently and she must have been on a minimum of 20 magazines so <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, no, I take your point. There is a real megastar there, but I don't know. It just feels like when I talk about the age of the megastar, I'm talking about Michael Jackson's statues floating down the River Thames with audacity and just the complete cheek of it all. And, you know, they were icons. They were so mysterious. But now to be a megastar, you've got to 
be very human, relate, to, and Taylor does that so well. She relates to teenage girls and early 20s girls so well and on a human level, right? That's true. And uh, But I do see your point. And I think that's also because our it's very different now. I mean, you have so many avenues with which you could become famous. You know, you, you have people like Justin Bieber who've completely gotten fame and success just through like YouTube videos and social media. And I think there are a lot of things now that are vying for your attention. You know, you have movies, you have television, you have the internet, you have social media. I mean, all of these take a piece of the pie, I think. Listeners don't think that I'm saying that there isn't talent involved. Taylor and Justin, you know, their pathway into fame was very different from back in the day, but uh, it doesn't diminish their talent, not by any means. I just miss the days where yeah, your superstars had the the veneer of superstardom and you couldn't really dig past it. But with social media, like it's so easy to see who they actually really are. And the fact that they're so human almost ruins it for me. Sad old man that I am there, Elwyn. And now Kylie Minogue, I know she's a big favourite of yours. So do you mind if I give you a bit of a pop quiz straight off the bat? Um, <laughs> you're going to test me, aren't you? <laughs> well, actually, I shouldn't call it a pop quiz because there are no wrong answers. How long have you been a Kylie fan for? I Well, I got into her around 89, 1990. I, oh, of that course, is early. When, yeah, well, when the locomotion came out, I, of course, knew of her. I wasn't... I wouldn't say I was a fan right off the bat when the locomotion came out, but I think Hand on Your Heart was really what sold it for me. And oh, wow. Had, yeah. So what had happened was uh, I was uh, I grew up in Canada, and I had just moved to New York City in 89, and I got a job immediately at an uh, import record store. And so they were importing a lot of Kylie records and Kylie CDs at the time. And so I remember uh, there was somebody in the store that was constantly playing the Enjoy Yourself album. And so oh, wow. I got to know Hand on Your Heart very well. And that's how I got into Kylie. That is a great story, especially from the perspective of a Canadian slash American fan, because we know that she wasn't as accessible over there at that time. Over here, there were... You know, those were the days where she was running down the street with her blonde locks behind her and crowds of people chasing a Beatles style. But I know in the United States, um, it's always been a bit of a niche market for her. Until these days, which we're going to talk about. What's your favourite Kylie era? Oh, that's hard to say. I, I mean, obviously, I was uh, really, really into her uh, around the time that uh, Shocked and What Do I Have to Do? came out and so she was really at a, a peak level for me there. Um, I still continue to love her a great deal, um, but I think Light Years also cemented her place as, you know, in my top top five favorite artists of all time. And obviously um, songs like Light Years, um, Kukachu, those <laughs> yeah. On a Night Like This, all those songs really, um, uh, put her right at the top for me. And then I had the luck of uh, going to London. I flew to London to see her on the On a Night Like This tour. And to wow. this day, that tour still remains probably one of my most favorite. It was very simple, but it was very charming. And um, I just fell in love with her after seeing her live for the first time, which was that time on the On a Night Like This tour. I'll tell you what, Elwyn, that was the most fun tour, and you and I are going to get along really well. What I've noticed is if people nominate Rhythm of Love era as their favourite, and there's a few of us who do, um, particularly if you're around, it's not just the music, it's not just the videos, it's what you knew she was going through at the time, the metamorphosis, the change. It was so damn exciting. But I, what I find is people who nominate Rhythm of Love nearly always – their second favourite era is Light Years because there's similarities, great similarities there. Really fun, pure, unadulterated pop, right? Yes, and very celebratory and happy. Exactly, very uplifting. That's exactly right. Hard question, your favourite Kylie song? Oh, boy, that that is a really tough one. This is I, like a Sophie's Choice for you, Elwyn. Uh, it, it wouldn't be... 
Uh, it, <laughs> there's just so many. I don't think I can give you a favorite one, but I could give you like maybe my favorite three. Go on then, go um, on. I'll allow it. <laughs> so uh, I Believe in You would be one. Mm -hmm. um, of course, What Do I Have to Do would be right up there. Um, confide in Me, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's a beautiful trinity. That's a beautiful trinity. I Believe in You always makes me quite sad. Uh, I know she loves it too, but the video clip for that uh, came out prior to her diagnosis of cancer. And uh, I remember the first time I saw it, and this is really going to sound spooky, possibly eerie, or a little bit crass, I suppose. But when I watched it, I thought, hmm, she doesn't look well. She looked a bit – there was something – unfamiliar about her at that time so every time i see that video i look back and she had cancer when she filmed that video but she might not have known it yet that's a very interesting observation i haven't noticed that but uh now that i when i rewatch the video i will be looking out for that. <laughs> i've ruined it for him oh sorry <laughs> listeners going well done he's he's celebrated his one of his favorite top three songs and i just completely put a wet blanket over it sorry elwin <laughs> no worries. And just so you know, uh, so your listeners know, uh, my first name is actually pronounced Ewan, just like Ewan McGregor. My apologies. Ewan, lovely to lovely to meet you officially, Ewan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the Kylie moment that you pretend never happened, what's that for you? Uh, <laughs> it's a long, <laughs> convoluted story. But oh, if good. you want to hear it, I'll I do. It okay. Uh, I think one of the advantages of Kylie not breaking the U.S. market as quickly as she did the, in Australia or the U.K. and Europe was that uh, it's afforded me the opportunity to actually meet her uh, quite a number of times. So I've met Kylie four times, and my favorite time would probably be the first and so we'll get to the part where I kind of regret, but <laughs> anyways, um, so what had happened was I was, I had mentioned earlier that I was working in a record store, an import record store in New York City. And in 1994, when she was about to record her self uh, titled album, the one that had confide in me on it, um, she got signed to a record company in the U S called Imago. Mm -hmm. And Imago was a, um, uh, a uh, subsidiary of uh, BMG Records. And uh, so anyway, several um, executives called up from BMG and called up my record store. And uh, they talked to the owner and the, they asked the owner, hey, you guys sell a lot of Kylie records. Is that true? And of course, the owner of, my record, of the record store I worked in said yes. And they announced that they're going to try to relaunch Kylie's career in the US. And so... She's working on a new album, and they invited two of uh, two of the employees to go um, up to the BMG offices in Uptown or Midtown Manhattan and have lunch with her. And uh, I begged John. I said, please let me be one of the people that can go up there and have lunch with Kylie. What and do so I have to do? <laughs> well, the good news was I was a pretty good employee, so he gave it to me. So he allowed myself and my colleague, Brian, to go up to the BMG offices in New York and have lunch with Kylie. So we arrived at the BMG offices. We were ushered into a conference room and there were perhaps eight to 10 record executives there. Um, and besides Brian and myself, I think there was only one other Kylie fan. I knew he was a fan because he had brought um, her, all of her albums on vinyl that had come out up until that point with him to have signed. So it was just really the three fans, myself, Brian, and this other person whom I didn't know, and then eight uh, record execs. So we were standing there. They were, you know, making small talk with us and you know, asking us how we heard about Kylie and everything like that. And then probably about 20 minutes in, Kylie just appeared. She was there with a friend. And she was, uh, I was very surprised, of course, as everybody is when they meet her, how petite she is. And uh, she was wearing a gray sweater with a small black mini skirt. And um, we sat down, they brought in kind of like a boxed lunch that they served everybody. And uh, after, the, after we all finished, um, 
we had an opportunity. Kylie actually went around and uh, sat down with each of us for about half an hour and spoke with both, all of us. And so it was really wonderful. It was my favorite meeting of the four that I've had with her. And uh, I had a long conversation with her, asked her a lot of questions about Danny, uh, her sister, and what, she, and what else she was working on. And um, so we come to the answer to your question, what is the moment I regret? Well, because I had such access to her, I think I, I let the fanboy in me get the best of me. And I asked her to autograph quite a number of things. I think she had already given me two or three autographs. And then I came back for a fourth item. I said, Kylie, could you sign this? Oh, no. And she was very sweet. She looked at me, <laughs> smiled and said, I'll be happy to, but let's make this the last one. And I realized oh. maybe I had just stepped over my, you know, stepped across the line. So I regret asking for that last autograph, but, you know, I was excited and there was nobody else there except the record executives. And I literally had, un, you know, uh, a total access to Kylie. And so, of course, I was taking advantage of it, not deliberately, but just so excited you already know anybody who meets their favorite star, you know, we're just, yeah, we turn into blithering idiots. <laughs> yeah. You become someone not yourself, right? Absolutely. But how this is Kylie all over, even back in 94 or maybe 93, this first meeting that you had, here she is. She stands up for herself in the most polite, beautiful, respectful, dignified way. So, yep, I'm happy to do this, but let's make this the last one. Yes, she does it very well. And um, I'm actually reminded of what you just said. She stands up for herself uh, in a very respectful way because I recently met her again. I met her in March of this year, and it was at the um, on the red carpet at the Billboard Women in Music Awards. Uh -huh. And um, by complete stroke of luck, I managed to get myself onto the red carpet, and I was there with all the photographers who were you know, from all the press and from all the American entertainment uh, news shows. And uh, they were all shouting at her, you know, Kylie, this way, look this way, look this way. And again, she was very polite. She said, I'll be happy to look this way, but remember to say please uh, to one of the <sighs> photographers who was wow. very, very, uh, very abrupt and, uh, <laughs> and very loud. So again, she was very polite, but she was, she stood up for herself. I just think that's amazing. And I've seen her do that quite a few times. Like you can YouTube. There's one where she's standing with Danny at a fashion awards and they're just talking to one of them at first. I think it's Danny. Then Kylie sort of huddles up and goes, hi, I'm here. And so the photographers, uh, the, the scramble, whenever it becomes a little bit too aggressive or rude, because I actually think if I was had an opportunity to ever talk to Kylie, as you did in a very casual, laid back way, not formal. I think I'm pretty sure her value system is just the word rude. She does not respect it, doesn't like it. Uh, and if she sees it, she calls it out. I can appreciate that. You know, I, I grew up in, a, as I mentioned, I grew up in Canada. And uh, for the longest time, uh, uh, politeness and courtesy was very, very, uh, very much part of Canadian life. And so I really can respect that. And, but uh, not necessarily a big value in celebrity life, though. That's true. That is true. And I think that's one of the many reasons that our Kylie stands out. Sometimes amateurs know best, and the lack of professionalism is all you'll hear on the Time to Talk show. Join Tim and his panel of guests as they wait their way through a range of news, music, and pop culture treats. Time to Talk, the show hosted by amateurs for unprofessional listeners. Now, uh, you and I got in touch with you because I believe that I, like many other Kylie fans, probably have seen many of your videos but might not realize it's it's you. But your Vegas videos 
were really exciting for me. I felt through you, I felt like I was there, someone who couldn't get halfway across the globe. But I appreciate um, that. Yeah, no, you you had some of the best videos, um, you know, in terms of quality and in terms of, you know, you, you could tell you were a Kylie fan. You were picking up things that Kylie fans would want to see. But you saw her in Vegas more than once by the looks of it. Would that be true? Uh, I <laughs> I kind of went on a Kylie bender and um, <laughs> she, gave, um, she gave 20 shows at Voltaire. Plus, in addition, she did one for the uh, F1 uh, Formula One, uh, yes. uh, you know, party. Great so performance. I saw, she actually gave 21 performances and I saw 20 of them. I saw You're the, kidding uh, me. No, I, I, uh, I probably spent the same amount of money as the, uh, as a kitchen remodel <laughs> on, on Kylie tickets. So yeah, I went to all of them. I only missed one Kylie show and that was due to the fact that I had tickets for another artist that evening, which I had purchased um before it wasn't chris christina Isaac. aguilera was it no it was chris isaac ah okay so um you yeah, and i, I hope you don't mind me asking but everyone listening is dying to ask the same thing how can you afford it we know that vegas was not your typical enjoy yourself 30 dollars a ticket it was like a minimum expenditure on drinks i think there was all it was expensive right it was very expensive it was probably it, without question, uh, this her residency at Las at Voltaire in Las Vegas was probably the most amount of money I've ever spent on one artist on one tour or residency. And uh, I guess the best way to say uh, to answer your question as to how could I afford it was I had this again. This opens up another can of worms, but I had sort of suspected for a long time there was going to be a Vegas residency. The reason why is because Kylie was in Las Vegas uh, the summer, uh, the previous summer, and right. she was seeing um, shows that were produced uh, by Spiegel World. I believe she was at Atomic Saloon, and she also went to see Absinthe. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, why is Kylie in Vegas? Wow. Um, you know, is she here for vacation? Or And then I thought to myself, maybe she's here to speak with people about uh about starting a residency so i had sort of picked up on that already mm. and so i think the reason why i mentioned that is because i thought to myself i think she's coming to vegas and so i had started to save money on the off chance that i was correct wow and sure enough it did turn out i was correct and so i saved a lot of money the other th ways that i uh, was able to afford to do the 20 shows was that I did general admission for most of the shows. Um, it the general admission tickets were at the back of the of Voltaire, and they didn't require a drink minimum. They were expensive uh, when they first went on sale. I believe they were after fees. I think it, they were about two hundred and fifty US dollars. Yeah, and then they released another bunch of tickets probably just before Christmas, and those tickets were three hundred and fifty dollars oh. for general admission. So uh, sorry, plus, can we deduce from that that the demand had been recalibrated so the price had gone up? Um, that is true. I think yeah. you could deduce that, but I also think that that was Voltaire's, uh, uh, you know, method of operation, I guess sure, is the best sure. way to put it. Um, I also noticed that the drink prices in the menu were also higher than when I first went the first time. <laughs> so they wow. also increased their drink prices as well. And How much would an average drink cost at Voltaire? If you did, if you purchased the two-person cocktail table, uh, which a lot of people did, which were closest to the stage, um, often I believe you're, you were charged initially when you made the booking you were charged 500 American dollars for just the price of the tickets for two people. And then it came with a minimum spend of approximately, I would like to say an additional 700 or $750. Oh, goodness yes. me. It, it is. But the, where they get you though, is I, I did that. I did actually do the cocktail table a couple of times. And, um, I do remember that, uh, I did the drink minimum, uh, my drink minimum, for, I think for the table that I got, for whatever reason, I think it was $500. Maybe it was because it was a table that was further away from the stage. And when I actually got the bill at the end of the evening, 
they had tacked on quite a number of fees that I was not expecting. They had tacked on a service fee, which was about 150. They tacked on a sales tax, which is another 60 US dollars. And then they asked for a gratuity on top of that. So my 500 minimum drink bill for that evening actually turned out to something more like 750 US dollars. Oh. And that's on top of the $500 for the, um, uh, you know, the, that, I, the, that I paid at the initial booking. This is a real premium show. And I suppose to an extent, people, I feel like there was a little bit of dishonesty because if I'd flown all the way around there, I didn't realize, A, that the show was not a full length show, number one. Number two, I didn't know about all those extra charges that would have been there. Did those extra charges apply when you went into the general admission as well? Did you have a drink minimum or could you choose not to drink? No, the good thing about general mission, which is why I did it most of the time, uh, was that uh, you didn't have a drink minimum. Um, right. If you just wanted to purchase one general mission ticket and s- spend your money on nothing else, you could do that. And so I ended up doing general mission for probably 16 of the 20 shows that I saw. Uh-huh. And the only disadvantage of doing general mission is the entire general mission I- area is at the back of Voltaire near the bar, and it is one level. So basically, if you didn't get in the first two rows in general admission, um, it was very difficult to see Kylie or the stage or anything except the back of people's heads. Is that so right? in order to, oh. yeah, it was, it was, I did arrive late one time. And, uh, and I was very disappointed to see that I could not see the stage very well. And mm. I was probably about five, you know, five people back from the the front of the general mission area. But so what that meant basically was that you had to get there early. And I remember when I f- went on the first, very first opening night, um, I was doing general mission that night. And um, I got there at approximately 6.30 in the evening. And uh, Kylie went on at 11.15 p.m., and so, you know, you're, you're standing for a long time. You're standing from about, you know, 6.30 till about the show ends at around 12.45 in the morning. So about 1 p.m. So you're on your feet for quite a bit. And, uh, and nowhere to sit. At, and nowhere to sit, correct. General admission was completely standing room only. And wow. as the shows went on, people started lining up for general admission even earlier. And I oh. remember towards the end of the residency you had to be at the venue probably at around 4 30 or 5 at the very very latest incredible and for people listening they might think wow you and this was way over the top to go to so many shows however let's put this in context for the entirety of kylie's career um, the united states has not been high on the agenda for touring, right? I know she had for you, for me, um, and I know she's – but come Vegas, if I was a Kylie fan over there but had followed her for as long as you had, you have to take the opportunity because you're not sure, right? I mean, this is – finally she's here, so I'm going to see her as many times as possible. I'm I'm suspecting that was part of your logic. Yes, that was my thinking exactly. And the other thing too is – up until then, I had seen Kylie approximately eight times. Each time um, prior to the residency in Vegas, I had to fly overseas most of the time to see yeah. her. So, I mean, there was the additional expense of, uh, you know, flights and accommodation and, of course, time off work. And so uh, they were, you know, I did it because I was so devoted to her, but they were expensive, uh, expensive, uh, you know, trips. And so when it was announced that she was going to do the Vegas residency, and I actually had just moved to Vegas <laughs> 10 years ago, um, I remember calling up all my friends and saying, for the first time ever in my life, I'm in the right place at the right time with regards <laughs> to Kylie. And so I said to myself and to them, I said, you know, when she does her residency, I'm going to just take full advantage, especially since... I don't have the added cost of flying here and the added cost of yeah. um, hotel and accommodation. Point, point taken. Fiscally, it made, it made a bit of sense because you don't have all that additional expenditure. Totally. Hi, this isn't Kylie Minogue, and I love listening to Time to Talk. 
Did you know at the beginning that you were going to go as many as 20 times though, or whatever it was? Uh, no, of course not. I, I think my original plan was perhaps to hit the show maybe once or twice um, each time she was back in Vegas. As you know, she would do most often she would do two weekends in a row and then take a break and then come yeah. back and again, do another two weekends in a row. And so my original plan was just to see the show maybe once or twice every time she returned. Um, but as I started seeing the show, I ran into a lot of people who were coming back frequently. And, and I think, you know, when you're with fans and everybody loves Kylie, I think it just makes the fanaticism worst. <laughs> That's all I could say. So oh, yeah. I think, um, I think, you know, I had decided, well, uh, you know, other people are coming many times, so I guess I'm going to come again many times. And then what I think made it even worse was that I had met two people there and they had found out that I had attended. I think I met them around the fifth or the, or the sixth show and they had only seen the show maybe three times where I had seen it five or six times. And they said, well, we're coming for the rest of them because I think they didn't like the idea that I might actually beat them in the number of shows. It and became so, a Kylie competition. It almost did. And I don't think it was like a um, a mean or malicious competition, but it no, was friendly. A, it was a friendly competition. And so I did have two friends that ended up seeing the show 18 times. Um, you know, so obviously the three of us kind of goaded each other on, I guess is the best way to put it. You won in the end, didn't you? Again, a lot of people listening are going to wonder, how on earth did you get the tickets? Because it's all very well for you to stand in a line and get a bit of friendly competition going on. But I went on that site when I was thinking of going over and was, oh, like, I'm not exaggerating. I think I was 50,000th in the queue. How did you manage to keep getting tickets, Ewan? Well, not like everybody. I and twisted about it, but how? <laughs> Well, like everyone, I went uh, online the day they were supposed to go on sale, which I think was August the 6th or August the 9th of last summer. And uh, like everybody, I could not get tickets at all. I was completely shut out and I was very, very, very upset and sad. Yeah. And so at that point, in answer to your previous question, I thought I probably would not see Kylie more than once or twice. So I was very, um, very disappointed like everyone. But then what had happened was... Um, Three days before the residency began, uh, Voltaire sent out a last minute email. I believe it was her residency was beginning on Friday that week. And then the Monday before at 6 p.m. in the evening, I suddenly got an email from Voltaire that said, uh, we've reconfigured the room <laughs> and we've added extra tables. So there are I more. I bet they had. <laughs> I bet they had. <laughs> right. And so there were more tickets available. And so I immediately went on and I think I was able to, on that day, book probably five or six shows. And then what ended up happening was just before Christmas, a whole bunch of other tickets very quietly got released. There wasn't an announcement like uh, like the email that I had received previously, but I just happened to one day decide, I don't know what it was, intuition. I checked the Voltaire website and all of a sudden tickets for all the dates were available for Kylie. And wow. I literally just uh, got out my credit cards and just charged up a storm and I bought the tickets <laughs> for the remaining run of shows. And the funny thing was... Um, when they went on sale just before Christmas, as I said, during this quiet sale, um, you were only allowed to buy two tickets because I remember they, for whatever reason, if you tried to charge a third time, the credit card was declined. So I ended up uh, uh, getting out all my credit cards. I think I have four. And oh, I stop it. You had, to, you had to get unique credit card numbers to do this. Right. So each credit card had to get charged two tickets for two different nights. And then I remember calling up my family, my mom, and saying, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm going to borrow your credit card number. I will deposit the money into your bank account first thing in the morning, but just letting you know I need your credit card number. And I was able to book another two tickets. So hang on, just doing the basic maths here, you went to around 20 shows, you needed 10 different credit cards. Um, well, 
I could use the same, I used the same credit card to book the, you know, the initial first five or six shows, but I did need, you know, for the final, I'd say uh, final 12 uh, shows or something, I, I needed another six credit cards, yes. <laughs> The award for the most dedicated Kylie fan in the United States surely goes to you, Ewan, because the logistics behind what you're describing are incredible. Well, I appreciate that. It's, uh, I think that's a wonderful honour, especially among Kylie fans. Sometimes amateurs know best, and a lack of professionalism is all you'll hear on the Time to Talk show. Join Tim and his panel of guests as they wade their way through a range of news, music, and pop culture treats. Time to Talk, the show hosted by amateurs for unprofessional listeners. Amateurs, is this the best that they could do? The shows themselves, let's talk about those, because for suckers like me who didn't get anywhere near the place, YouTube has been a gift and... and as I said, media like yours, it seems like a Kylie, a style of Kylie, a side of Kylie, a performance of Kylie, unlike any other we've seen up on tables. Um, we've known she's loved this from back in the day, intimate and live. She's always, since a very young age, said, I love it when I do this. I love doing the big shows, but I actually prefer the smaller shows. For example, there was uh, Café de Fleur in France. I remember she did um some around the white diamond documentary she did some um ballads there um intimate and live was a version of intimacy even though those were quite big shows if anyone was there they'd know what i'm talking about but this seemed like she finally achieved that closeness that she'd always craved in a show did it feel like that when you were there um absolutely i think there was a simplicity to the show. Um, obviously, Voltaire is not a big venue. Their stage is not one of the biggest in Vegas. And so I think there were certain limitations as to, you know, um, when you think of some of her produ previous productions, like the um, uh, Aphrodite, Les Folies uh, tour, and, uh, you know, the even the For You, For Me tour, um, these involved a lot of, props a lot of uh a lot of um you know visuals uh, they were they were big productions as was of course um tours like the fever tour and the showgirl tour i mean so this show i think for some fans some loved the simplicity of it some were disappointed i found um mm. but it was it wasn't about the big production the show was really about uh being close to kylie and you were. I mean, the stage is configured in a way that everybody at some point during the show gets somewhat close to Kylie, if not right next to her. And um, and so I think it had a certain simplicity to it, which I enjoyed very much. And as you mentioned, I think the focus really was on this is where your opportunity to get up close with Kylie. And so, as you mentioned, the dancing on the tables, um, her... Uh, walking the runway and you know there were a lot of people who were seated right along the runway and even at the at the end of the runway so, how close did you get to her uh, i was quite close i mean um the one the few times i did do the cocktail tables i was right up against the main stage so much so that on the final night uh, you may have seen on my Facebook page, I was wearing a T-shirt of a picture of myself and Kylie together. And I was so close that she could see that. And she know I could see that she noticed it while she was singing. She looked at me, saw the T-shirt, and I could see a very subtle reaction, um, you know, basically to confirm that uh, she did notice my T-shirt. So I was very close in that regard. And um, as you you yourself saw in the videos, there was definitely some video footage where she was right in front of me. And, uh, and you know, I love it when the artist can sweat on you. <laughs> and, and there was a moment where Kylie did. <laughs> so. I love that. But can I tell you, this is no longer uh, a concern for me at all. But when I saw her so close to the fans, that so close that literally they could touch her if they put their arm out, 
I was really concerned. I've never seen Kylie in that situation before. Uh, I really haven't. And it worried me. I thought, wow. And, you know, no disrespect to your country where you live, but it's the United States as well. Um, it feels like there's a different threshold for potential for things to go wrong with celebrity. Absolutely. Uh, so I don't know. She obviously had no concerns herself. She's out there holding hands as she's getting lifted up and off tables. I noticed one of the dancers seemed very protective. Maybe that was his job. Um, he was always very close just in case it felt something went wrong. But I don't have that concern now because my point and the question I have for you is it felt like the audiences were oh so respectful. Um, I felt that they were to her for sure. I mean, uh, you've got to remember that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, American, North American fans, and even there were a lot of uh, fans that flew up from South America. Um, we just haven't had the opportunity to see Kylie live uh, at all until the residency. It's been very far, uh, few and far between. And so I think these people were really, you know, happy to see her and very they're definitely devoted um you know adoring fans and i think adoring is the key word here i don't think there was anybody there that didn't want to just love and show their love for kylie and bask so there was that. in her presence um, right yeah yeah and then the other thing too uh for people who didn't attend the shows at voltaire uh, the security was strict uh before we were allowed to enter the venue we were uh, you know, we were asked to open up bags and we had a metal detector wand that was waved oh, good. over us. So they did, you know, make sure that nobody was carrying any weapons. The other thing too, I noticed, and again, this is again, because I went to so many shows, I noticed that when Kylie was at the end of the runway or on the table, you're absolutely correct. There were staff in place, their job, they were dressed in black. So you know, they didn't show up often in the videos, but uh, they were there definitely to step in if anybody got really rowdy. And so I noticed like this, the staff would kind of congregate at certain parts of the uh, of the uh, venue at certain times. And that was, of course, because they knew there was going to be a point where Kylie was going to be in that area. And so they were prepared, which I give uh, total uh, props to Voltaire for. And I think that Kylie herself needs some credit for this too, because there are lots of celebrities who wouldn't dream of getting that. that there's an invisible barrier between themselves and fans. And to an extent, there always has been with Kylie, um, probably not by her doing, but there just always has been. But here, her desire to get close. Like I'll give you an example. In many of the videos, she reaches out and she holds hands. And I... I could be just starstruck by Kylie as I always am, but I feel like if it was a different celebrity, the potential for that fan not to let go because they're a more frenzied breed of fan or because it's not Kylie and the, the celebrity might be a little bit more crazy and wild. But with Kylie, there was a real dignity. I noticed the fans would take her hand, they'd shake it, but then they would respectfully you know, note that time frame, I suppose. I have to admit, if I was there and she took my hand, I probably wouldn't let it go purely because I'd be frozen with complete shock. But I noticed that. It was just a dignity given to her. I agree. I, I think I did see that as well, too. And I think the other thing, too, is, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, she's very petite. So I think a lot of fans were very respectful that not to be rough. And, mm. uh, and, uh, so I think she was treated with, uh, a gentleness, uh, which I really appreciate too. And as I said, you're talking about a room full of people who just adore her that we don't want to see any harm come to her. So, you know, of course, tell me about that crowd because I, I have been a, a Kylie fan right from the beginning. I know what a bunch of Kylie fans looks like, feels like, acts like, behaves like. But I'm curious to know if in the United States I might notice something different. Can you, as someone who went to 20 shows, were there particular behaviours or profiles that you can describe to us in terms of American Kylie Kingdom? Yeah, I mean, there's something I noticed right away. It's funny you should mention this. Um, I noticed that when I go to uh, the UK to see Kylie, it is a wonderful mix of uh, husbands and wives, a lot of female fans, 
a lot of male fans, a lot of straight male fans, and a lot of gay male fans. And what is interesting is when you see Kylie in North America, especially in the States, the audience tends to be predominantly gay men. And uh, I noticed that right away. And in fact, the women that I saw at Voltaire were often people that had flown over from Australia or from the UK. Uh And the American fans tend to be all men. (laughs) So Wow. So it was a room full of mainly males. Yes. And I'm reminded because I did see Kylie on the first two nights of her um, uh, tour on the For You, For Me. And I saw her in Oakland, California, which is, as you know, uh, a suburb of San Francisco. And I remember when I first saw her there, uh, even William Baker commented, look at all these men, because the audience was almost 100% <laughs> men. Uh, you know, well, so. that's, I mean, when you, when you trace back the roots of that, it makes sense, because she had almost what you'd call an underground following in the United States. I think it was after Enjoy Yourself that she had no record label over there. It was only re-established around maybe Fever. You might correct me on that, or Light Years Fever. That is correct. You're absolutely yeah, correct. Yeah. After uh, Enjoy Yourself, she lost her contract. And as I mentioned, they were going to relaunch her for the self-titled album in 94. but It didn't happen. They got the yeah. CD single out for Confide in Me, and then Imago went out of business. So Kylie was without a record contract again. And I think anybody who wanted to be a Kylie collector, such as myself, the only way we could get those albums that weren't released in the U.S. was, of course, through import stores. And then, you know, those tended to be in the large cities in the States, like New York and L.A. So, And were you doing that as a fan? I mean, you, you said you worked in one. So obviously you knew how to do it. Not everyone does. But th- were you still at every era, every single, every album managing to get your hands on what the rest of us were getting? Absolutely. Uh, whenever a Kylie album came out, I was at the record store the day of release. And I remember um, I had moved back to Canada in 98. And uh, when Light Years came out, it did come out in Canada, but it didn't come out in the States. And I remember racing over to HMV in my local Canadian city and buying the album right away. And uh, (laughs) I remember saying to myself, I'm so happy it came out in Canada and uh, I don't have to, uh, I don't have to order it or, uh, you know, go searching for it. But even though you could get your hands on them, who are you sharing the excitement with though? You know what I mean? Uh, That's absolutely correct. I mean, I remember when I first moved back to Canada from living in New York, I was telling everybody, oh, I'm a huge Kylie Minogue fan. And a lot of people were going, who's Kylie? And um, and so I was very, exactly as you said, I, I was very much a loner for a long time. And I don't think it was until Can't Get You Out of My Head came out that I started to find other Kylie fans in the U.S. And, yes. Uh, and uh, But I remember... Hotter than it, ever, wasn't she? Hotter than ever. Hotter than ever. And I remember I was working, after I moved back to Canada, I worked uh, at HMV Canada for a while. And, um, and I remember speaking with all my colleagues at work. Oh, I love Kylie. I can't wait for the new album. And a lot of them didn't know who she was. But when Fever came out, I remember playing it frequently. And then when can't get you out of my head, started climbing the charts. Other people started in my store, started to realize who Kylie was. So, Yeah, it was an amazing time. I remember her over there in the United States at the Virgin Mega Store for the signing. She took time off from rehearsals for the Fever Tour to go over there and do the Blitz. What's it like now? I said in my last podcast that I couldn't put my finger on it, but what I do know to be true, I can't evidence it, but what I do know to be true is that Unlike the Fever era or maybe the Locomotion era where Kylie had some foothold in the United States, this one, the Padam era, feels like this isn't a flash in the pan. This one feels like it's what I call knitted. The last two were Kylie's hot, but then she disappeared. This era feels to me like she is now entwined into American celebrity culture permanently for good that might have something to do with the Vegas residency but it's it's what she's getting invited to this is me trying to put my finger on why I'm saying this it's the celebrities she's getting um, photographed with it's the celebrities who are talking about her it's uh, 
the honours she's getting over there. I don't believe that this moment in celebrity in the United States is a passing one like the previous ones we've seen. I think she now has a permanent base in the United States in terms of performance and presence. I also think her profile there is known. Give me a flavour from the United States yourself. Am I on the right track? Is her, she's starting to become much more of a permanent name in the world of celebrity? I think so. I th- Let me put it to you this way. I think she is more known in the US now than she ever has been. I still would say that like, 50% of the people that I meet won't know, don't know who she is. And then the other 50% do know who she is. So she's getting there. And I think a lot of that also has to do with, I, I can tell that this year, Kylie just said, you know what, I'm really going to make an effort to break the US market. And so she's been appearing on, you know, all sorts of American uh, music award shows, American programs. So I think that has definitely, of course, been a large part of why um, she's raising her, you know, the consciousness of the American public about her. Kylie's attitude has also changed. She, the only moment I've ever seen even a touch of racism without Kylie is about the American people. And she has done this since the beginning of time. When I used to watch her around Enjoy Yourself, she'd come back and she'd put on that accent, the American accent that she does so well. And in a Parkinson interview, she talked about the fact that, oh, I go over there and all the executives are talking about their golf game and I'm sitting in the corner and I feel very patronised. She talked in the fever era when she returned from her blitz over there about and mocked, quite frankly. You can disagree with me, listeners, but she absolutely came back and mocked all the radio stations and the interviewers. Who are you? Kylie Minogue, I'm a locomotion girl. She mocked it. And I believe quite sincerely, she's very British, which means, you know, let's tone things down a bit. Let's not be so over the top about celebrity. When she goes over there in the past, I feel like she comes back and thinks, wow, that place is insane. But this time I feel like her attitude's changed. I think as a human person, she's starting to relate to the American public, her American audience, but most importantly, uh, American celebrity culture better than she ever has. I don't think she looks down on it and I believe she used to. I I think there's some truth to that for sure. I think uh, she's made a concerted effort to really work uh, the American media the way that um, I think she has not done so in the past. I think she realizes that there is a certain game that she has to play, and she's she's making an effort this year to actually you know be in that game. Yeah, I think the respect is there two ways, and. For me, it's the first time I've seen that. Kylie Minogue! Hi! <laughs> well, and you're currently in the middle of your Vegas residency. Yes. More than a residency. As an artist, what makes doing a residency different versus going on tour or doing a show like this here tonight? Well, you don't have to pack things up, for one. <laughs> I like There's a few things housed in Vegas. But I've really loved the experience. It's a really intimate show, but it's got the energy, like, the, like this crowd. The audiences have just gone wild, and I've loved it. And they seem to be getting wilder, which yes. is weird. Yes, indeed. You get us up off our feet. The energy. Yeah, they is have beautiful plush you. chairs. They've got you know velvet chairs and bonquets and tables. They don't sit down the entire show, which is kind of what I was hoping would happen. Well, I know that I'm going to be up off my feet tonight when I'm watching Please you. Please do. I'm so yeah. excited. Thank you so much for stopping Thanks by. Thanks for I having me. I you got to get ready for the show, so I'll let you get out of here. Have a great one. You too. Bye, everybody. Sometimes amateurs know best, and a lack of professionalism is all you'll hear on the Time to Talk show. Join Tim and his panel of guests as they wade their way through a range of news, music, and pop culture treats. Time to Talk, the show hosted by amateurs for unprofessional listeners. What did you make of the show after seeing it so many times? I I mean, I loved it, but it was shorter than I would have liked. I would have preferred a uh, an hour and a half at least. Uh, it, was, it was approximately an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I think an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minutes would have been lovely. I was surprised at the um, um, omission of several of her hits. Yes. Voltaire is 
fantastic for a song like On a Night Like This, and she yes. didn't perform that. Um, <laughs> I was also surprised that uh, there were very, very few songs from the stock Aitken Waterman era. Mm-hmm. Um, she did do, of course, Locomotion, but uh, that was basically it. We did get, you know, 10-second a cappella clips of, like, uh, of uh, Got to Be Certain, I remember. She did One Night uh, a cappella. Uh, she did do um, uh, I Should Be So Lucky uh, a cappella for about 10 seconds. We did get like little snippets, but we just certainly didn't get full length versions of those songs. Um, so I was surprised at the omission of that. And I think that if you were coming into it after seeing something like the Showgirl tour or the um, Aphrodite, the Feliz tour, uh, you would have been disappointed the how simple it was. Um, because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a over the top production. It was very, very simple. I think the focus was on Kylie and whatever Kylie outfits was wearing, <laughs> she was wearing, and uh, and then also, uh, you know, the a lot of the um, backup dancers for her were actually the performers in the Belle de Nuit acts. Uh, for those of you who don't know, before Kylie went on stage, um, there were usually about eight five minute performances usually in cabaret style or acrobat style um, by uh, different performers. And that was kind of like the opening of the show. And the, a lot of those performers ended up being backup dancers for Kylie when Ky- Kylie finally hit the stage. So um, it was it was interesting. You could tell, I could tell that they were trying to um, make it cost effective, but not skimp on the, uh, you know, on, on giving you a very good show. It was a very good show. Um, it was different. And as I said, the focus was really on the fact that you're here's a show where you're going to be close to Kylie. Um, it's not going to be about, you know, uh, disco ball skulls, you know, coming across the uh, stage or anything like that. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be just about Kylie looking really great in whatever uh, designer outfits she has. Um, and you're going to be really close to her as she sings. And so that was the focus of the show. And if you went with that attitude, you were definitely got what you wanted and you were not disappointed. Did the set list change very much show to show? No. In fact, I was uh, surprised that it was pretty, um, it was pretty much the same every show. The only differences that I saw was there was one performance where she performed uh, Let It Snow. That was, of course, one of the shows before Christmas. Uh-huh. Um, she only did it the one time, and she never performed it again. But other than that, uh, as I mentioned, every night we were served up maybe a 10-second a cappella mm. version of one of her hits that wasn't part of the normal set list. But other than that, it was not. It was. But I thought the, the um, again, I'm relying on YouTube clips here. I thought the second song was interchangeable. And I also thought the Elvis cover was not always present. Supernova uh, and right. something else I thought were on a bit of a rotation. And I didn't know if Elvis came up every night. No, it wasn't a supernova wasn't on a rotation. She did perform it the very first evening and I was very happy that I happened to get a video clip of it. Um, she never performed it again for the rest oh. of the, uh, of the <laughs> and so I did ask fun. her. I, I ran up, uh, I met one of her backup dancers uh, at a, a show, maybe three or four shows later. And I asked what happened to supernova? Why was it cut out? Because the choreography was excellent and it was. And the backup dancer even said to me, he said, that is my favorite song that we did the choreography to, but Kylie didn't like it. And after the first night, she cut it out. So Kylie right. didn't like what? The song or the, the choreography? I, I don't know exactly. Right. She just didn't right. like its inclusion. And so it was never included again. What was it replaced the, with again? It would go from light years into what? It, it wasn't replaced by anything. It, it The first show, oh, it's yeah. she opened with light years, went into Supernova, and then and then finished up with Your Disco Needs You. Um, on every other night after the first night, she went immediately from Light Years into Your Disco Needs You. And Okay. I think there's this strange idea, I find it strange, that Light Years and Supernova live together. As soon as Disco came out, a lot of fans said, oh, they're sisters. And I think at the World Pride in Sydney, Light Years and Supernova might have been melded together too. Correct me if I'm wrong, listeners. 
But yeah, uh, for me, they don't live together. So maybe, maybe she just didn't see. Maybe it's not that she didn't like Supernova. Maybe it was the placement. Who knows? It could be. And then as for the Elvis song, she did perform that every night that I saw. Ah, so okay, yeah. And was you, that beautiful? It was, you know. Um, but you got to remember, I love Kylie, so I would love to have heard, <laughs> you know, another Kylie song. And and the thing is. You know, living in Vegas, I hear can't help falling in love everywhere. So <laughs> I am not, you know, I am not for, let's just say it's not a song I go, I wish I could hear that song because I hear it so much already. So, yeah. uh, you know, and so for me, I would have preferred Kylie to do, have done, you know, uh, something different. Um, maybe, you know, je ne sais pas pourquoi. I don't know. Something, something interesting and new. Can I just ask for celebrity presence, her presence in the shows? Is it is it as electrifying as it has always been? And uh, and second to that, the voice. The voice sounds better than ever to me on video. What did you make of those two things? Yeah, her voice was fantastic. And I have to give credit to Voltaire. They do have an amazing sound system. Um, I was really surprised when I saw the show the first time and I continued to be impressed and uh, blown away by how good the sound system is at Voltaire. So I do give them credit for that. Can I ask specifically what you mean by that? Because one of the most frustrating things I experience, and no, it's not old age, folks. It's been since the beginning of time. Is when you go to a concert and it's so loud is that it becomes like um, rattly. You can't even hear, you can't appreciate the melody or the song or the singing. You can't appreciate anything. In Voltaire, I'm assuming it was loud because it's a concert, but was it? were you able to actually hear the way it's meant to be heard? Uh, I felt I it was, yes. Yeah. And, you know, I've, as I mentioned, I've seen Kylie at Wembley Arena in the UK, in London, and um, and, you know, uh, the sound at Voltaire just is was just so much better because it was wow. a smaller room. Um, it's very plush, meaning that uh, there were a lot of chairs and sofas with you know uh, uh, plush fabrics. So I don't know if that had something to do with the acu- help the acoustics, but absorbing it just sounded it, absorbing it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounded like a really nice, good club sound in a small. Uh, intimate venue that was not you know this there was no distortion and uh and i know exactly what you're talking about like i've seen rock concerts at uh, and pop concerts at large arenas and the sound is just sometimes just horrendous and uh but uh voltaire has a good sound system so kylie's voice was really really on her voice was on point and then the sound system really really uh put it out there for you. So yeah. it was take note venues, take note ICC center for the golden tour, absolutely appalling sound yet. Yeah, maybe, maybe you've just nailed it. You and it might be the, the size of the venue Luna park for um, anti tour, amazing sound, intimate and live at the state theater in Sydney, beautiful sound. Uh, you know, obviously we go to a Kylie show to hero. It's, it's a terrible thing when you walk out of there thinking that was just, 90 minutes of distortion. You're listening to Time to Talk. You've met her four times. You've told us about one of those times. My question to you, Ewan, is what is it like to be in Kylie's presence? Is there, I know this is going to all sound rather nosy, but I don't know, is there an electricity? Is there a presence? Is there a, a smell or a perfume? Is there... What is it like to be in Kylie's presence? I mean, as I mentioned, she's just lovely. She's very gracious to her fans, which is um, which is a wonderful thing. And not all celebrities are like that. Um, I'll be quite frank in saying that uh, the times that I've met her, of course, I was so excited. I'm shaking just like anybody else would. Mm. And so I and the moment just passes so fast. I mean, um, so the times that I've met her, I'd like to tell you that, oh, it's just lovely. I had a lovely chat. And while I did the first time for sure, I'll be quite honest in saying that I was so excited and so um, uh, beside myself that uh, uh, it, 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 it is a little bit of a blur. And 
each time I've met her, it's felt like only maybe 10 seconds because, uh, um, you know, it just goes so fast. And like everybody, I have all these things I want to tell her, these questions I want to ask her when I meet her. But the minute I see her, all that, my mind just goes blank. And so uh, <laughs> I, you know, so I'd love to answer it better for you. But the truth of the matter is being in Kylie's presence is like, meeting somebody you just absolutely love and I've always wanted to meet and 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 it just goes so fast and it's a blur. This last time I met her, which was again back in March at the uh, Billboard Women in Music Awards, I was on the red carpet and she was being interviewed. She was working the carpet from left to right. Was that the and one when she was wearing the green gown? No, she was wearing the black uh, gown with the silver silver sparkling straps. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. So uh, she was working the working the uh, carpet, and she was being photographed and being interviewed by you know American programs like Entertainment Tonight and Access Hollywood. And I saw a break on the right side where there were wasn't anybody standing, and that's where I waited for her. And as she came towards me and passed me, she was actually about to walk into the venue when I shouted out. Kylie and I had brought up a photo of the two of us that was taken back in 2002. And I said, Kylie, this is us 20 years ago. Oh, wow. And in pure Kylie fashion, and this is what I mean by she anticipates, she goes, well, we need another photo together then. And the thing <laughs> is, it was wonderful because I was going to ask that, but she had already anticipated, um, you know, that would have been something I would have wanted. And she was already ready. She was the one that suggested it and uh, was ready to pose with me. And so I was just like elated that, you know, she had, she was even the one that suggested it this time. And then um, for those of you who happen to go on my Facebook page, I have a, a picture of that moment. And it was just so adorable. She was like, she leaned her head on my shoulder and, uh, it was just a very, very lovely photo. And um, I've received so many compliments about it. I'm, everybody says, oh, Kylie just looks like she's just in love with you. <laughs> and I said, it's, she leaned I, her head on your shoulder, did she? She put her head on my shoulder as if, I, I mean, I call it like, she's my girlfriend photo <laughs> because that's what it looks like. But, oh. you know, uh, of course, that's not the case. But she looked like, yeah, it looked like a photo of a couple. And I just thought it was just so charming and adorable. And so that was the photo that I had put on a T-shirt, which I wore to the final night of uh, the Voltaire residency. It sounds so sweet and beautiful. I'm, I'm definitely going to look that up. Uh, let, me, let me tell you something, Ewan. I am often asked, why have you been in this affair with Kylie since you were whatever, nine, eight years of age? And the answer is pretty much the same. There is an emotional intelligence about Kylie that is rare. Uh, it's very instinctive. I noticed it from the beginning. A lot of Kylie fans who've been there since that young age have felt like an outsider. And Kylie somehow, through the screen, even through Neighbours and Henderson Kids, made us feel included. I still... I see her emotional intelligence shining every single time I see her in an interview. Sometimes I'm much more fascinated by the way she is with her eyes supporting the interviewer who are often really nervous. Have you noticed even in the United States, oh my God, it's Kylie, they're shaking. They're getting the, the Ewan effect that you described, but she holds them up with her spirit and her energy. That's how invested she is in the middle of her work. She's like, okay, this person's a bit nervous. I'm going to hold them up with my gaze, with my energy. And that's so special. What is it about Kylie that makes you such a fan? Um, it's all of that you, that you just said. It's the fact that she is, um, as I mentioned before, very lovely and gracious to her fans. I think she's, she has perfected the art of being the perfect pop star. And she is... That's the thing I like about her. She, as I mentioned, she's lovely to the fans. She understands that um, even though she must get requests every day to, for photos or autographs and stuff like that, she recognizes that uh, when we meet her, it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing for us. And so she's just 
always very polite and lovely to us, even though it might be the 900th request for an autograph that she received that day. So it's that. Um, it's the fact that she's very consistently good with the uh, material that she releases. Yeah. And uh, I mean, every album is a, usually a very good album. I do know some fans will probably have some exceptions, but uh, I think <laughs> most of her albums are generally very, very of a good quality. Um, I think it's that. I think it's for me in the beginning too. Uh, I know that this probably doesn't apply to a lot of uh, European or British or Australian fans, but for me, sh she was like a best kept secret for me. So I was a fan because, oh, I like this star who nobody else knows about. And uh, so that certainly in the beginning was a lot of my, um, the allure for me. Whenever I listen to Tim and his panel of guests, my toes begin to curl and I feel just the right amount of tingling all over my aching body. Now, let's get back to the show. Oh! Ewan, I'd love to just spend a few minutes talking about where to from here with Kylie, because we've got a few immediate things coming up and it'd be good to speculate with you for a few moments where we think Kylie's heading next. But I hope you don't mind me saying this. It's absolutely lovely talking to you. You strike me as someone who is a true gentleman, a professional, a gentleman, intelligent. I've loved talking to you. Well, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed speaking with you as well. That's a very, those are very kind words. What's coming up next? So we've actually, you know what? Let's start with hearing from Kylie herself. First of all, this look, who are you wearing this evening? I'm wearing a custom Gucci dress. You look beautiful. Um, you've had a lot going on from the Brits to performing with Madonna. Yeah. You know when you have like busy times and you're like, you know you've been really busy, but other people don't. So when you say I'm, I'm kind of tired, they're like, yeah, whatever. But actually this last week, I have people saying, as you've just said to me, they're like, are you okay? You've had a really massive week. Yes. Um, and I'm more than okay. It's been incredible. Uh, and yes, the Madonna surprise moment was incredible. Uh, let's look forward. Uh, it feels like there is a reimagined tension coming out, maybe before another full album. That's sort of the sense I'm getting. Are you getting a sense about what's coming next? I think so too. I think we might see something similar to what you did with Disco, where um, we're going to probably see multiple formats with additional tracks. Um, hopefully, with uh, <laughs> I, I can't remember if I saw any uh, professional recording devices at uh, Voltaire during the residency, but I would love if the residency got released on, uh, you know, if it, if not a DVD or a video of some kind, then at least a audio live recording of the show. Would you like to see uh, an official Madonna collaboration on anything coming out soon? Um, you know, I was, I'll be quite frank with you. I was a huge Madonna fan for a long time. And uh, I'm, you know, Madonna kind of, I know this is going to upset some people, um, but Madonna kind of fell out of favor with me for a little bit. And uh, while I still love Madonna and uh, I have seen every single tour of that Madonna's done, um, I'm just not so gung-ho like so many fans. Like I remember when Kylie appeared at her show in LA, there was almost a meltdown. And I remember thinking to myself, what's the big deal? <laughs> and, wow. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I love Kylie. And I t also like Madonna, but uh, I must be one of the few Kylie and Madonna fans that's just not so gung-ho about uh, a collaboration with the two. I would rather see Kylie do something with somebody more, which I felt would be more suitable for her or her voice or uh, the right song. And if if they, she and Madonna were to come up with a great song, I suppose I wouldn't, I would totally be for it. But I, there's nothing in me that says, you know, I wish you would work with Madonna. There's, there's nothing. And I don't know why, because I do like both. Um, but and that's reasonable. And there's, it's not just you, you, and I'm telling you, there's a, there's a lot of fans out there who for the longest time have been like, so what, who cares? But I had that itch. I needed to see them photographed together. That's all I wanted. 
Um, My only regret and, was I was in LA that day and I didn't see that Madonna show because oh. of course I didn't know Kylie was going to be there. And I, so I regret not going to that. And I could have, but I, for whatever reason, I did not. And uh, I think it's because I had just seen Madonna in Vegas uh, the week before. And so I thought, oh, do I need to go see Madonna again? And then, of course, the, I decided not to go. And that, of course, is the show that Kylie showed up at. So You must have been kicking yourself. Have you got an idea about what sound you'd like to hear next? Do you want more of a tension sound? Or are you after a new direction from our Kylie? You know what? I... I trust Kylie. I defer to her to what works for her. And, you know, I know a lot of people, a lot of fans were not crazy about Golden. And when Kylie announced that she was going to do a country-themed album as Golden, such as Golden, I actually was looking forward to it. And I actually like Golden very much. But I did hear a lot of people in line when I was waiting in the general general mission line who said uh, they thought Ky- uh, Golden was not great and i was like are you kidding i love dancing i love sincerely yours i love these songs so i i think you know kylie knows what works for her and so i'm happy to get anything that she thinks is is good and like i remember when impossible princess was coming out um a lot of people uh, particularly i think i'm I, I could be wrong and i'm so sorry if i i am but um, I know a lot of people in the UK did not like that album. I know that album was a hit in Australia, and that's why she did the intimate and live shows there. Um, but I know that album was not accepted by a lot of UK fans. Uh, but I liked it. Um, I loved Did It Again, and I love the fact that she was trying something new. Is it, in retrospect, is it her finest album? No, but at the time, I appreciated that she was trying something new, and it was different. And, you know, she was trying to take her sound in a more indie type direction. And uh, I, I still play Impossible Princess all the time. I love Cowboy Style and did it again. And so I play these tracks all the time. Very exciting era. Very exciting era. Hey, Ewan, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I think we've, we've, we're both on the cusp of finding out new and exciting information from Kylie. It wouldn't surprise me if we get a surprise drop in the next fortnight or so about what this next project is, only because I'm wondering if she's going to coincide some announcement with uh, Hyde Park that's coming up. Um, it would be a good time to announce something, or maybe I'm just yearning and wishing she'd announce something. I'm not sure. I agree. I think something new is coming. Um, I was, I attended the, uh, her performance at the Out Loud Festival in West Hollywood recently. Oh, yeah. And I was very surprised when Were we Were you got there started. when Orville Peck came out? I not only was there, I was in the front row <laughs> having, having, uh, waited nine hours for, to get, to get in the front row. And I don't know what it was, but I had my camera ready and I caught the entire, uh, song in uh, probably one of the clearest, most close-up versions that I've seen so far. So I, That's probably yours I've been watching on repeat. That's a, I love that song. It's got mixed reviews from fans and the broader public, but I think, it's a, I think it's brilliant. What do you make of it? I love it too because, as I mentioned, I love the golden era. I know uh, a lot of fans didn't like the, you know, that country sound, but I, I'm a big country fan, and so you know, I love country and pop. And so for me, I thought it was really fun. And um, Orville Peck is somebody I haven't paid that much attention to. Uh, you know, I thought when he first came out with, you know, the fringe mask, I thought he was a rather strange character. But I've grown, <laughs> to, uh, I've grown to like him a lot. And, uh, and uh, I-, I was surprised when I saw him um, just how sexy he was. I was very surprised because uh, I hadn't thought – very much of him up until that point. But he was I'd never very- heard of him, Ewan. And anyone listening, go back and listen to this delightful fan, Simon, in our last podcast. I think it's got Justin Timberlake on the, on the cover. But if you stay tuned after Justin, we talk to Simon about Orville Peck, who I'd never heard of, but he's a huge Orville Peck fan. What blew me away when I saw that performance, even on the crappy clips on YouTube, was his voice sounded beautiful and caramel and rich and and then when i heard the studio version that confirmed that to me he's got a beautiful voice 
He does. And he has got definitely has some charismatic uh, stage presence as well. Uh, I definitely saw that when he did the duet with Kylie. And um, he he just there was some the interplay between the two of them was just incredibly charming. And uh, so I I was very happy to have seen that performance. I was happy to have caught the whole thing on film. I was happy to have been in the front row. I was happy to, you know, be one of the first people to ever hear that song. So I, you know, it was, I'm really excited about what's coming next. And um, I do think we're going to see some new music from Kylie. I think we're going to hear the announcement of a tour. And I wish I could join the UK fans for uh, Hyde Park, but I will not be there. Um, but uh, I do th- hope there is an announcement, and I hope it's an announcement of a tour, a world tour. That's what I'm hoping for. Well, you and I'm looking forward to staying in touch with you because uh, you're delightful. You're as fanatical about Kylie as I am. And I, I absolutely mean it when I say I'm so pleased for you and other American fans that I get to speak to that she's there now she's a presence and as i say i believe that's going to be a permanent thing you guys in some ways have put in the hard yards even more so than other kylie fans across the world because you've had to hang in there and you've had to be patient you've had to take extra big steps to get your hands on all of her work over the years so my god i can do nothing but take my hat off to people like you who've been so committed for so long well, I appreciate that, and I have really enjoyed speaking with you as well. I um, I think we're going to be friends for a long time, and uh, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, I, I've been to Australia. It's been a long time now, but I was there in the late 90s, and uh, I actually have a great affinity for, uh, for Australia because it reminded me very much of my home country in a better weather climate (laughs) it's true a lot of people say canada and australia have great similarities i i went to uni when i used to live on campus and there were quite a few canadian international students there and i would ask them you know what's it like being so far away from home and they said well believe it or not this is really similar to canada the attitude the, the the personality type apparently there's similarities absolutely i uh i actually found Australia was more similar to Canada than the U.S. And oh um, God, I hope so. <laughs> I, yes, you know, I would imagine. It's a, exactly as you said. It's uh, it's the same sense of humor. It's the same uh, sensibilities. Um, I think Canadians and Australians are are a friendly lot, and um, I uh, there's there's a certain. Um, ease of lifestyle in both countries i i love the united states don't get me wrong but me living in the u.s can be very stressful i mean you're dealing with a, a far more crime than uh, in canada and uh, probably australia as well um you're dealing with uh, a very stressful lifestyle that's very um uh, very much geared to around uh you know earning money and in Canada and Australia, I found it's more about just enjoying life and uh, having a laugh. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. And and I love the United States too, and po- possibly I misunderstand the United States, but I try to follow American politics. Where it just seems like there's a lot of rage and anger. And over here, there can be too about politics and certain political issues. There can be divisiveness. In the United States, it feels like the poles are just so far apart. I would often, uh, when my friends would ask me, you know, what's Canada like? I would say um, everything that's great about Canada is even better than the United States, better in the United States. Everything that's terrible about Canada is even worse in the United States. So <laughs> you're right, there are more poles apart and... Uh, and uh, And uh, I totally agree with that. And uh, I think there's a gentleness that uh, Canadians and Australians have that uh, Americans do not. Uh, Not saying everybody, of course. Again, pleasure to talk to you, Ewan. I'm looking forward to catching up with you again sometime soon. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. 